is, I just want to get your name first and last and the correct spelling so I have it on tape. Okay. I'm John McCarthy. And the spelling? M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y. M little c? M little c? Yes, Mike. Yeah. M-C. Yeah. So where do you grow up? In Riverside, California. Small town. Not anymore. <laughs> but it was. That's why we left. All the nice small towns are no longer nice small towns. It's hard to find them. Yeah, they're uh, it's totally different from when I was a kid. I know one small town down there, but it's up in the hills, up in uh, up by Alta, a little town called Dutch Flat. Oh yeah, I think I've been up in there. <laughs> kind of by Colfax. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Huh. Highway Forty Nine. Yep. Sure. Yep. So how did you get in the, the, did you go into the service young or were you older when you? Well, no, I, uh, when I got out of high school, I was still 17. And at 17, uh, before the draft age, you could enlist, didn't even have to have your parents' consent. And uh, I thought, geez, I want to go in the Navy. I always wanted to be in the Navy. So I uh, went into LA, where it's as close as recruiting station, 50 miles in LA on the bus. And uh, got up at the first desk, guy opens the book, you know, the Japanese color book, says, read the numbers. What numbers? <laughs> well, you see this eight here? No, I see a little piece of something. <laughs> Uh, here's your ticket home. <laughs> that was the end of the Navy career. Yeah, <laughs> broken hearted. So I went down to Pershing Square and sat around, thought a while, walked to the bus station, the Greyhound bus station, and uh, Army was upstairs. I went upstairs and enlisted. <laughs> Just like that. Took the Navy's ticket <laughs> So, uh, because I enlisted, they let me stay out for some time. I, shortly after I turned 18, I didn't have to register for the draft because I enlisted reserve. So they said, go to college or whatever you want to do. So Riverside had a very good junior college. Everybody went. So I uh, went there, and uh, four months later, they called me. Also, because I enlisted reserve, I had special treatment coming in. That's one of the good guys. <laughs> All the draftees are over here, and there are eight of us over here that enlisted reserve. Well, fate changed my destination all the way through my whole life, practically. I uh, got to Camp Fannin, Texas. Great spot. <laughs> uh, Garden of Eden. <laughs> and they went up the top of the hill to, uh, they sent us all up to radio school. And the infantry is all down, there's 8,000 troops down here training to be infantry. And a small group up on the hill to be radio men. I uh, ran into a high school classmate who's just getting out because, see, I'd left four months and stayed at home. And, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, he said, this is great because you're in trucks all the time, you go around Italian, big radios, you learn a trade and all this stuff. He ended up in Italy, a radio man. I uh, sat there with these guys, we played pool and horsed around, we couldn't go out and pass, and said, when the class fills up, we'll let you know and we'll start. About a week later, we said, hey, Sarge, <laughs> When does our class start? Oh my God, I forgot all about you guys. <laughs> you have to go down to the infantry, we filled up the class. <laughs> I became an infantry. <laughs> so I <laughs> go through basic and infantry and uh, made a lot of old friends and uh, went home on leave, came back. Every time we went from Texas to California, to like crossing the country, I ended up crossing the country seven times in troop trains. 
and went north and south a couple of times. Anyway, the uh, I get to uh, Fort no Fort Meade, Camp Meade, Baltimore. We spend a week there. They send us up to Camp Shanks, New York, and ship us out in the Mauritania. We go roaring across, and the subs chase us all over the Atlantic. We go up to Iceland and huge seas and uh, C2 ships sinking in front of us and as we came into the Irish Channel. Got off and uh, we are now all replacements, unassigned at this point. But we uh, go to Southampton, get on a channel ship, crewed by India, Indian Indians, <laughs> you know, cloth, loincloths. <laughs> Little things, and uh, they uh, we land in France a few about a month after D Day. Place was still a mess, you know. Just and we had to go down the nets into a uh, rocking uh, uh, landing craft. Went into the same place in, on uh, Omaha Beach. That he attacked us. I mean, attacked, and you could see the. Pillboxes and everything went up. They broke it through at St. Low just before we got there. So we're badly needed now. Uh, replacements were in great demand. And we chased Patton across France. Otherwise, it would have been in earlier. My friend Frank was already in. He came from Texas as a replacement. But again, he was four months ahead of me. <laughs> Did you have enough um, communications at that time? I mean, did you get enough news to know where it was that you were landing? I mean, did you understand what had just happened, or did they keep that from you? So They pretty much kept it. Uh, you Once in a while, you get the uh, stars and stripes, and uh, you could catch up on news, but it was always late. So we really didn't know what was going on right ahead of us. And yet we raced across France and stopped south of Paris overnight and raced on Cotton at Reims and got assigned to the 5th Infantry Division, 10th Regiment. Came in, the, they had, in a static position, they ran out of gas, taking Mets. Uh, tanks actually were in Mets and came back out because they had no more gas and set up a perimeter all around the area. We stayed there five weeks in these holes. <laughs> and I mean, we had super holes. <laughs> Added to them every day. Frank and I had, had one at L shape. He was studying engineering. And we had a super foxhole and cover on it. So I don't think it repulsed the shell, but it might. <laughs> so you kind of made, made it feel like it. Made and, home for a uh, uh, little house for you. And it rained and rained and rained all those weeks. One of my experiences uh, while we're on the front was it, uh, in the static position. Uh, mind you, I'm still 19. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, Let's see, what, 19? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I turned 19 coming over. And the uh, election came up November 7th. Roosevelt was running for president. So we we're all going to go down the woods and vote. And I go up to the table and say, How old are you? 19. You can't vote. I can't vote. I'm up here. <laughs> And you won't let me vote? No, the law says you have to be 21. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was bad the rest of the war. <laughs> and, uh, the uh, whole thing was the, uh, we moved up and down this line, and finally, on shortly after November 7th, as always said, they're waiting for the election. We pushed off in a spectacular World War I type of attack. So, Everything going all at once. It's, I came up in the hill and I, I was just astounded. I looked around all across. I could get over the, the tremendous show that was going on. Big Berthas and uh, screaming memes of the Germans and 
all our rockets and everything it lit up the whole front. You could see for miles from this little hill. I was on. Well, Frank and I went back to these places on our trip. Tried to find a monastery we cat, uh, took over and uh, tried to find some line of these holes, but we couldn't find them. You know, they plowed them all up. Huh. Meat farm land. So it's just this this mass of everything. Everything moved all the way up the front. What did it? You know, this is one because movies give us this perception of what it what it was like. Do you remember what it sounded like? Well, the noise was fantastic because every piece of artillery and mortar was firing. We were uh, told to take farmhouse, which is a fortified farmhouse. We've been looking at it for weeks now and sitting there. Germans had fortified the basement and the house the windows. Plus they laid mines and all the field in front of them down to us. And we walked through that minefield. And uh, they were shoe mines. Germans made wooden box shoe mines. They were called step on and blow your foot off. So you're wounded. It's worse to be wounded than it is to be uh, killed, practically. It's a bigger burden on the army if you're wounded. So uh, a guy leading would step on a mine, and then the guy's following his footsteps. He'd go around him and go on. He'd sit there holding his leg, you know. This happened maybe half a dozen times going up this hill. And uh, that's when we saw how spectacular it was just walking through this minefield. And uh, somehow we, most of us got through. And the Germans evacuated the farmhouse and came back later in a counterattack. And we got them in the counterattack and wiped them out. So. That's my first big firefight, even though I'd been on the line for five weeks in these holes. <laughs> Rain, the bottom of the hole would fill up with water. <laughs> you wake up at night and the water would be up to your ears. And <laughs> God, that had to be terrible. I mean, just... Yeah, well, you, there's no place to shower or shave. Or, well, you could shave if you wanted to heat your water, but uh, we went for weeks without showers. And uh, they had shower companies mostly Negroes, <laughs> who came in the, with all this equipment, set up these tents in some muddy field. At least it wasn't muddy when they went in, but by the time all these troops came in and out, it got pretty mushy. They throw you a change of long john and uh, give you five minutes under the shower after five weeks. And it, they'd ring a warning bell. If you're soaked up, you're supposed to rinse off and get out. And they'd explain all this. And half the guys get caught and <laughs> soaked up. You know. <laughs> all yelling at these guys. You know, or they just shut off the valves. Jeez, terrible. Well, the, uh, we were also, I always considered it a, a, a terrific idea for the military they used the infantry replacements for pack animals. We had two of everything. And so just before I got to the front, I changed, put on my clean pair of long jobs. I get to the front with this 80 pound pack of junk, <laughs> dirty clothes, and drop this thing. He said, you won't need that. And they all die for it, <laughs> the old guys. The sergeant takes the long jobs and puts them on. <laughs> I've been wearing it for two or three weeks. <laughs> Jeez. I said, well, I guess this is the way we're going to live for a while. And sure enough, I didn't take those prayer I put on and take them off for almost two months. Wow. So, uh, now, is it, besides being wet, is it cold at this time? Not too cold yet. It, uh, this is uh, like September and October. November started getting cold, and uh, it had been the worst raining winter. There had been a little light snow when we pushed off. And in one of our attacks, we had to go through a stream up to our waist. <laughs> Jeez, we're soaked, you know. 
and uh, my rifle jammed, and uh, I, this happened to me uh, on different occasions for different, BAR did it. The, the only thing that lasted was a bazooka, 45 count. Uh, and it wasn't because I didn't keep them all polished and clean. It was uh, just that they were, uh, that, I don't know, just, uh, we thought it was reloaded brass. The brass and bullets we got looked like they'd been used before and they were reloading them, see. Huh. Getting the expended cartridge and putting new head and powder in. <coughs> so we were getting some of those already and uh, it'd jam up our equipment. The uh, story about the pack animal stuff, though, is actually the way they got their supplies. The night I went through the stream, and you soon dry off your clothes in, in a hot battle, and this was a tremendous firefight we're having, artillery. I caught up with Frank, I got separated from him, traded my rifle with a guy that just came to the company. New replacements don't last long. If you last 30 days, you figure you might make it all the way. <laughs> he had a bullet in each leg, leaning up against a tree. I said, didn't you just get here? I said, yeah, last week. I said, uh, how's your rifle work? Oh, it's fine. I said, well, you take mine, I'll take yours. <laughs> and I took it, took off up the hill again. <clears throat> Caught up with Frank. We dug a hole. In fact, we found a German hole, and we got into this next to a monastery, and um, it dropped, temperature dropped tremendously that night. And uh, I, being an amateur at this sort of thing, I left my socks on the side of the, I took them off, and wrapped my feet in a sweater. I had two sweaters, and I took one off and wrapped it. And uh, I did this frequently, which saved my feet. And because Frank didn't do it, it almost destroyed his feet. He, uh, <coughs> next morning, I'm sitting there with a K ration box, a nice wax box that burns real good, and drying off my socks, <laughs> trying to thaw them out. This guy comes along carrying a box of, of rations. Hey, buddy, you need a pair of socks? <laughs> I said, I sure do. He's supposed to be a pair of double sole wool socks. Oh, he's my friend for life. <laughs> so I, I uh, did this wrapping several times. I figured if they're going to come, I was going to save my feet and get out and run barefoot or something. You know. Well, later on, Frank wounded. He goes back to England. And all his calluses are turned black. And they had to cut them all off, dead skin. It took him weeks, a month, a couple of months to get over to be able to walk again. He had no calluses on his feet. Wow. To this day, I still have some frostbite. When we got to uh, uh, Metz, Frank and I walked for blocks and blocks around the city, trying to thaw out our feet, which didn't work. <laughs> Go to the med ed aid station to give us two aspirin. <laughs> I said, keep the damn aspirin ones out. <laughs> they won't get out of my feet. <laughs> <clears throat> so we uh, tried to work them off, but uh, by the time we get, oh, within a few weeks later, most of us were just hobbling. We could hardly walk. We were really, feet were burning, you know, it, frostbite's really bad. In fact, when I got home, I was on VJ Day. I was home, and the war, I was in swimming with my sister in the municipal pool, and all my toenails fell off. Wow. <laughs> I reached down, I felt this funny thing. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it all came off. And even now, the big toe on my left foot gives me fits. It's 50 years later. Yeah. 50 now you talked about uh, being wet and then going into battle and drying out. You sweat so hard, so much, and you're, if it keeps up and you're, you're nervous fast and you know, tension and all that. 
uh, in your climbing and puffing, carrying your ammo and all that, you sweat a lot and you dry out your clothes. <laughs> wow. I, I, I never realized that because I, I yeah. would just think that you would have been just wet and yeah. cold all the time. Well, if you stop totally, uh, you, you would actually uh, get very cold. Uh, there were times uh, where uh, we had too much uh, clothing. I collected things and I ended up in the Battle of the Bulge with uh, a pair of long john wool pants, uh, waterproof pants, Mackinac jacket on top of my field jacket and sweater and wool shirt. <laughs> and when I tack, we're running through a field of snow or something, you build up a lot of heat, you sweat inside all this stuff and then you stop and it starts freezing up on you. <laughs> That's, that's when it gets you when it's down really cold. Like this night was, without the wind chill, it was 15 or 20 below. Wow. And we were stuck in the snow. Uh, we were in holes, German holes. I built up a bed of twigs on the bottom. Frank had since gone to London. <laughs> and I had this little Italian with me. And, Chain smoked all the time. <laughs> he wants a nice cigarette. <laughs> don't do that. I don't the whole countryside. <laughs> uh, we were attacked in uh, Echternach, city of Echternach, in uh, near uh, the bottom edge of the bulge. <clears throat> the bulge was uh, quite an experience because it's ice and snow all the time. We uh, sent our armor in a, uh, a uh, combat team to rescue the 101st and Bastogne. Broke through with the 4th Armored, our tanks, and saved uh, Bastogne, which we visited on our trip. And uh, we also uh, cleaned up, kept the uh, lower flank of the bulge. The bulge went like this, and the Patton came up and hit it in the south. We were in uh, Hector, uh, Town we were in uh, Lutweiler uh, across the uh, no Sarlotter across the river Sarbrucken, the big city. And Frank had been wounded the day before, and we'd taken this village, and uh, we were in the village and got a lot of replacements and moving up to actually enter Sarbrucken across the river. And they said, okay guys, everybody on trucks, everybody out. Oh, hell, they're going home, the war's over. Nobody says anything. 48 hours of open truck riding. <laughs> we ended up in Luxembourg, city of Luxembourg, 15 miles out of Luxembourg, the other side. We got off the trucks and started fighting. It's that fast. Wow. So from then on, we're nice and snow, and. Uh, I took Frank uh, back because he got wounded in the woods outside of uh, Sartlotter. And I said, that's where you got wounded over there <laughs> in the woods. Oh, thanks. <laughs> were, were you busy all the time? No. Uh, uh, we wore, uh, did you see uh, Private Ryan? Uh, there were periods when they're no fighting, you know, they're walking and searching, trying to find the lost units and stuff. We did a lot of that and changing fronts and changing positions. But we're always within shelling range of the Germans and uh, they shelled us and we shelled them and back and forth. And for those combat months, uh, actually uh, eight months of it, 240 days, uh, we were under constant firepower, you know, some kind of power. If we went back five miles to take a break, they shell us back there. Or we'd be under the muzzle of a 155 shooting back at the Germans. They go, boom, shake you out of your sack, you know. So it was a constant uh, tension thing. But you got to be 
I got very used to being an infantry soldier. When uh, I first came to this little village, we were all exhausted and uh, I sat on a chair in the kitchen and had a bunch of new replacements and Sonny Galliardo from Brooklyn, uh, quite a character, he, uh, he was scared to death. He was running all around the place. Shells were coming in from the Germans. I was sitting there trying to get a nap. I said, he's quiet down. Well, yeah, I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> I was tired, you know, really tired. And I think that's probably the worst thing that happened to me as far as uh, fighting was the lack of sleep. We rarely got to have a full night's sleep. Once in a while, like they sent me to Theonville with a couple of other guys and uh, relief, just to have pie and ice cream and rest a little bit for two nights and come back. We come back and the companies move 15 miles. And we, I come up to the CP, the, the lieutenant comes out and he looks like hell. He hadn't slept for a couple of days. And he, same lieutenant all the way th uh, through, except he gets promoted on up and out. <laughs> Great guy. He is 23, <laughs> six foot four. And he comes out and looks at God, McCarthy, where the hell are you? <laughs> oh, I went back to have some pie and ice cream. <laughs> she said, well, your hole's up over there. Go. And this German sauce, and he shelled it all out of this corner. I dive in through the door, and the building falls down. <laughs> all the blocks and bricks and stuff come flying down. Say thanks, Lieutenant. Welcome home. <laughs> so I go up to the hole. And we start the whole thing over again. Same. We we got to be. It was just our life. We were living as much as we could. This uh, kid from Texas, uh, another guy from Texas, James Thelbert Martin. I think he grew up with the name Thelbert because he looked like a Thelbert. <laughs> He, uh, he's a brain. He's a math. He ended up graduating from Vanderbilt with a math major. <laughs> and uh, I haven't had any correspondence with him, but I just got the, the word here and there. Well, I met Martin on the troop train coming out of Mississippi. I was attached for a couple of weeks to this division after basic and they were shipping those up to go out. The division stayed. I saw them later on the front, four months later. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, Martin was a son of a minister in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. He never had a date, never played cards. He didn't know how to play cards. He didn't know anything. <laughs> Kind of a smart guy, and he collected all these things. I taught him how to play seven card rubby, the most basic game I could think of. He wouldn't leave me alone. He wanted to play cards all the time. I'm McCarthy, he's Martin, and everything goes alphabetically. <laughs> so we, same place and same bunk area in, on the Maritime. And he wants to play cards. I said, Martin, I, I, I can't play cards all day. <laughs> And so we played all the way in the troop train to New York and all the way across in the boat. <laughs> then he'd collect things and he'd get the ration packages and he saved every letter he got from home. I then found out why we had these field jackets with accordion pockets. <laughs> he had a full. He looked like a woman walking down the street. His pockets were so bulged out with stuff, food, Letters, anything he collected, he put in his pocket. And he, later, when we started getting K rations and things with the plastic container covers, he used those to keep them dry. <laughs> Boy, it, I saved his life <coughs> two or three times. And, uh, he walked along the road, maybe reading a book or something. <laughs> Hear a shell coming, you got very sensitive to sounds. Mortar shells, artillery shells. You knew if they're yours, they're theirs. They're coming 
in earth are going to go over you. And uh, Martin has sprawled along the road and I go out and dive at him and knock him down into the ditch. And boom, all the shells have fallen around. You see him walking along the roads. Well, this happened two or three times. And then he gets sick. He, uh, when the sergeant comes around and says, okay, saddle up. Your stomach goes, <laughs> drops. You know where you're going. And uh, what saved us a lot, well, in that story, uh, Martin uh, would uh, get sick. And he missed quite a few attacks because he really got sick and throw up and hung it. Go back to CP and the attack would be over and he'd come back up again. And he realized he was doing this. And he says, well, at the end of the war, he says, well, we made a attack, but uh, uh, I guess I missed a few. <laughs> I said, yeah, Martin, you missed a few. <laughs> but we had some pretty wild experiences. Uh, this little uh, company of guys, most of those in the pictures survived. It's amazing because they were taken uh, mostly in April when we're up in the river pocket. We could actually stop for a while. And uh, the, uh, we had about a week or so to clean up and clean up and springtime was out, the flowers were out. <laughs> Very warm. <laughs> we peeled off all our clothes and got rid of all our winter stuff. The ship was down and marches over to the black <laughs> mountains of the snow <laughs> and we're freezing to death. So we covered a, an awful lot of miles and people I talked to don't can't believe me half the time because we I'd say we took this city and this city and this city. Oh, come on, you could, you know, you just move across the front. No, we went up, you saw the picture in the book. When we went north, we came down south. And you're mostly, uh, <coughs> I mean, how often did you get transported by truck? You usually were marching along, weren't you? No, not a lot. Uh, we, we would attack and take a village. You look. I, for mon <coughs> months after the war, in fact, I'd look up and see a hillside of trees and think, geez, i got to take that now. Take the hill and take the valley, take the hill, take the valley. And so you, each time you stop, but there was no rest, you were either shooting or firing or taking it, you know, ducking. So you got very tired of that, but... Uh, if you change positions for any distance, you didn't do like they did in uh, World War I and force march you 20 miles or something like that. If you had to go over five or so, they'd get a bunch of trucks and take you in the trucks. And fortunately, the most Americans knew how to drive trucks because <laughs> the drivers were so damn scared. They'd run <laughs> and they wouldn't get back in time for the convoy to move. And, Guy would get behind us thinking, away we go, and he'd be running, you know, just catch the last truck. And they were funny. That was Red Ball Express, you know. The guys in that thing were a riot. What's it like? Because you had a, a, a picture of. Are taking we a, recording, by the way? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you, you had a, a, a picture of, um, of taking a village. Uh, you, I, I could see the tank and, and everything like that. What's that like? Well, uh, the villagers either had evacuated a long time before or they'd gone into the basement of the thing and uh, some houses had, had basements. Uh, that particular village was one we swung down on riding tanks for 300 miles from the Ruhr near Essen all the way down to catch up with Patton. And we rode on the backs of these things for three days and nights, uh, some nights, but usually we come into a village and take it over until the people get out and we steal the eggs out of the chicken coops and have fresh eggs. Never had fresh food, you know, it's always canned ration, except we had a cook that was 
something else. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of uh, Pat and taking a leak in the Ryan River from the bridge. It's been nationally. I, I saw it since in recent years. Our cook took that picture. <laughs> oh, I, really? I hope he made money out of it because it's priceless. Huh. We were the first uh, outfit to cross the Rhine in water assault since the Romans. Wow. No one had done this before. Because it's such a big river and you could defend it because of banks and all that. Well, when the 9th Division got across the bridge, they get beat us by one day. We were, Patton had all these boats, and sailors, in some cases, but outboard boaters, ready to take the troops across and beat them. He was determined to do it. You know, he didn't get all this until later. And if you read the history, he uh, actually missed it by one day. Huh. But it still became, in that regimental book, it, described that they became the first uh, uh, assault across on the water, not on a bridge. <laughs> and we beat the British up north and, and beat them. That was a interesting thing that, uh, you know, the war was uh, sort of winding down, but there's, you still get killed <laughs> very easy. <laughs> We'd taken worms and moved up to a village called Ventersheim. And we stayed overnight in Ventersheim. It was a little tiny village a mile or so off the river. Uh, one of our requirements was to clear a village. And we go through every house, every room, every basement, everything we think of. It took us months before we discovered the Germans smoked sausage in the attics. Once we found out, <laughs> we did very well. <laughs> it's amazing, their chimney would go up and stop, and this room would be a smoke room. Then it would go out another chimney up above. So this whole thing would be hanging with sausage. So. And so the war was almost over before we found that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just like if you came into, say, like Olympia or Tumwater, and all the citizens left, I mean, the houses, they just leave, mm -hmm. right? So you aren't in necessarily destroying stuff, you're in... Well, the infantry doesn't. Uh, they, uh, you know, we're, we're too tired to go around wrecking things and we don't steal things either. Uh, these things are all military that I have. Uh, one thing I was about to tell you about though in this village, and in the process of clearing it, I came through the what was apparently the Burgermeister's house and office, and who I've since met, by the way. <laughs> the uh, hanging in the closet was this beautiful tapestry, about four by five feet of uh, satin material with uh, a crown on one side and imitation jewels in it, and uh, on the other side was the iron cross with an eagle holding it in its claws. And across the bottom was the word Wintersheim, the name of the town. You say, well, it's, it's the, the other side is a military organization in Germany. It was a military souvenir, and that's all we took because we were told that's all we should take. Plus, you had to carry it. <laughs> I folded it up, and I had these other few things with me. And I uh, took it to the cook, who I now become good friends with. <laughs> he, he'd been with us quite a while. And uh, I said, uh, I'll leave these with you. And if I don't make it at crossing the Rhine, you can have them. Otherwise, I can come back and get them, ship them home. And I had a, a fur jacket, uh, rabbit skins that Germans wore, and they wouldn't let us wear them. Cause, uh, fur got into the wound. Boy, it had been nice to have <laughs> And I had a brand new one, so I kept it for a while and uh, packed, uh, left it with the cook. We attacked across the Rhine and were successful, and uh, after it was all over, he moved the kitchen over, and I went back and got my stuff and packed it up and mailed it home, and it got home. Couldn't believe it. I tried to mail it beautiful rifle home, 
uh, early German rifle, like the bayonets and early German army bayonet. Hard to find, because we broke the butts of hundreds and hundreds of rifles. Most of them were cheap pine. This one is hardwood and old-time old manufacturers. Well, the, uh, all the stuff got home, but the tapestry, I had my college room in every house my family lived in, in six some houses around in different cities as I moved from job to job, you know, trying to go up. And uh, <coughs> when we got to up here, there's no real decent wall to hang it on. So uh, communicating back and forth for Frank, we decided we would uh, seek out these people. I wrote to them and had a the person who sold us a house in Olympia. I was out in the waterfront. She was a German girl. Now my age or so, and uh, she was uh, orphaned in uh, Germany during the war and married to an Austrian and uh, very nice people. And we uh, had her translate this letter to the Burgemeister of this city and called the council and got the proper district address. No answer came back. <laughs> couldn't understand it. I was offering to send this to them if they'd like to have it. Since no offer came, I thought, well, I'll uh, see if I can find them on our trip. We searched all around, found where we crossed the Rhine, collected a few stones for our kids and stuff, and uh, finally found this little village. And I couldn't remember it being so small, but uh, everybody was going to a religious meeting that morning. And, but the Burgemeister was there and at his farm, and a big tall guy, and we talked, and he says his father fought on the Eastern Front, and uh, he was too young for the war and all this, and we were just trying to get acquainted, see if these people were nice enough to give him back this tapestry. We didn't take it with us. And uh, <clears throat> so we took pictures with this town sign and all that stuff, you know. And uh, when we got home, uh, Uta, the German girl, was going to visit her mother. She, she was not totally orphaned. She, her father was killed in the Eastern Front. And uh, she, uh, her mother had put her in an orphanage so, for 12 years. So she, in a way, she was badly abused, but <laughs> since became very close to her mother and uh, was going to her 80th birthday. I said, well, you remember our letter we wrote? And I said, if you'll take this and call this guy and see if you can return it to because I thought it'd be nice if they got back this very nice double-faced uh, tapestry. So she goes to, uh, uh, where are the uh, Mercedes made? <laughs> and, uh, South Germany, a uh, city we didn't take. Uh, she, that's where her mother lived, and so they called the Burgermeister, got hold of Oh, we'd love to see you, I'd love to have it. So he puts out the red carpet, has it for lunch and a party and all this stuff, and treats him royally. And turns out the guy owns a widery, <laughs> and we didn't know it. <laughs> I did drink anyway, so <laughs> he, uh, he sent back some of his wine and uh, a letter and some photographs of how important he is in the German Burgermeister Association and <laughs> all that sort of thing. We uh, uncorked the wine and served it to guests one day at my 75th birthday <laughs> and uh, we, uh, it, you know, it's all right. <laughs> So uh, it ended up nicely anyway. Wow. Well, that's neat. Uh, but about the civilians, uh, we really didn't know too much. And no one told us very much about where they went. On our, uh, when we were fighting in Frankfurt, it took us three days to fight 
and control the city, fighting from building to building and back and forth. And uh, I was with a squad, we captured a big shot. I don't know what the outcome was of these big Nazi with boots and pants and took off all his stuff up from there on up. So I'm sure he's somebody important, but we just tied his hand and sent him back to prison. Uh, we came to the bank, of, uh, which now is called uh, Deutschland Bank, <laughs> the biggest bank in the world. <laughs> and here is this building, and Frank and I remember it. Frank's back now, and we. Uh, but I'm a bazooka man, and he's back with the BAR. So uh, <clears throat> we separate, and I stay with the company commander. I uh, We pull into this bank, and uh, the tanks are fighting up and down the street, shelling each other, and the shells are going past the windows. And we're totally exhausted from fighting and, and straining, you know, no sleep. So we, uh, I take over the president's couch, nice leather couch. I'm the old veteran doll, you know. <laughs> Carries a lot of weight when you're 19 years old. And uh, the, uh, it's one of my problems was this kind of baby-faced and young, you know. And, and uh, to try to have any authority, I'm still a PFC, but that's uh, another long story. The uh, we go back and look at this bank when we visit it. It's gorgeous. And behind us, a 60 story headquarters building. <laughs> this is only a two story building. I said, Frank, where were you then? He said, I was upstairs with the squad. Where did you sleep? On the floor. <laughs> I, said, oh. I said, I slept on the president's couch. <laughs> ah, <you. laughs> so uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, mind you, uh, when GIs get to a place to stop, they have fun. They try to break the tension if if there isn't any enemy too close. They'll fool around. <coughs> and uh, down the basin were these uh, subterranean uh, cells, uh, doors with uh, little holes on top for if the water got that high, he <laughs> had problems. <laughs> And there was a cage there with typewriters and stuff in it, and uh, the guys tried to blow the doors on the on this, these safes or whatever they were, and no luck. And I wasn't about to fire my bazooka down to the closed basement, so they use a few grenades and nothing works. So uh, we didn't have any C2 or C4. So we uh, next morning at seven o'clock in the morning, in walks this man. Gray flannel suit, black tie, uh, what's the German hat? Uh, not the, not the, the door, not the fedora. But the, no, uh, <coughs> got a brim all around it, you know, banker's way. And he walks, beautiful. You know, here we are, <laughs> scroungy and dirty as hell. And this guy says, what are you doing here? <laughs> what? <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> he says, I am president of this bank. Oh, so. Uh, why are you here? He said, I came down to see about my money. Your money? And all the guys almost, of course, say, your money. Uh, he says, yes, I have $700,000 down in those safes in the basement. <laughs> and we couldn't blow up. <laughs> uh, later in our tour of... Uh, Frankfurt. We arrived there and stayed there a couple of days and didn't look around. And uh, I found out they had a subway, and all the people were down the subway. They were oh, like, really? almost like bomb shelters. They're deep and they're well fortified. And the guide told us that when they're bombing or attacking the city and capturing the city. All the civilians were down, and we walked right over. <laughs> wow. So they just, because you would just basically move, I mean, you would maybe stay a day or night, and then 
Yeah. Boom, you were on. So if they hid... We'd go from building to building, house to house, and as we're going through, I have a collection I didn't bring with me, a cheap little buttons. We came through a button shop. <laughs> I stuffed my pockets with these buttons. But they, I did bring it along because we're all mounted on a, on a felt thing. So the uh, guide says, told us about this thing, and uh, when we were fighting in the streets trying to get around this tank that's given us trouble uh, and killed our radio man at the rail station, uh, I was trying to get him with a bazooka, and trying to maneuver around. Here's this pretty teenage girl, or maybe she's 20, I don't know. <clears throat> Not bad looking. <laughs> Looked better every day over there, but uh, she had a skirt and sweater and blouse on and stuff. She was following us. Then we saw her pick up the telephone. She, and the telephone system was still working in the city. Nobody tells us this. She's telling somebody where we are. So we had to take her prisoner and take her away from there, see, get rid of her. But she she knew all the civilians who were down there, I'm sure. There was an old part of Frankfurt which was uh, totally destroyed by the Air Force. They didn't really intend to, but they bombed Frankfurt for five years, so there's hardly a building standing except for this bank. <laughs> it's still there. And still is today, the same building. <laughs> all remodeled, marble everywhere. So uh, this uh, guide, German woman, maybe the same one, uh, now an older woman, uh, taking us through and showing us all this display of the way the city looked in a model and then how it looked after the bombing. You know, it's, there's hardly a building standing. Uh, she said, uh, all of this area you're in, it's very, it's all been rebuilt. It's the oldest section of Frankfurt. And in the church, nine uh, heads of the German Empire were crowned in that church. It had been destroyed and rebuilt. Everything's been rebuilt. And she said in 52 minutes or something, all this area was flattened by the American Air Force. And I said, lady, who started the war? <laughs> and she said, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> I said, don't you say that again. <laughs> wow. <laughs> kind of a funny uh, little incident. Uh, I guess uh, freezing in the bulge was uh, an experience that none of us forget because it's always cold. Nearly all the time we were outside. We rarely got to a village and a house. We did, it was a joy, you know. Tried to build a fire or something. And one time I was, we were trying to build a uh, perimeter foxholes in the snow. And we have these dumb little shovels you carry on your belt. <laughs> points aren't very strong. And in one hour, in this ice and snow, I dug a hole one foot by one foot by one foot. And the guy came by and said, hey, I need some volunteers to go on a patrol. And so I said, hey, I'll go. <laughs> because you'd end up at the kitchen, so you'd have coffee and breakfast. So we made a patrol down to contact this other outfit, and they're, they're, they were uh, outposted in a cemetery. So we go into the cemetery, it was right on the front. The Germans are in the woods in the cemetery. The guy said, be very quiet, they're just over there. <laughs> so we make contact, check them out, and say, okay, fine. So we go back to the kitchen and warm up. <laughs> The, uh, probably the biggest battle we have is reported in that regimental book I pointed to. Uh, it wasn't five tanks, it was six tanks, because there was a platoon of tanks of, 
of six or of eight, and two of them kicked out on us purposely. I'll swear to this day. <laughs> but the uh, there were three villages. The division is bulge was over, snow was all gone, and we division was attacking uh, Pittsburgh, which is now a big Army Air Force base in Germany. Uh, across from to the, uh, I guess, the south of uh, Pittsburgh are three large villages, uh, Picklestein and uh, two other villages. One is a walled city, a village, very old city, or v Berg, I guess you call it. We knew nothing about them, and uh, the, our my platoon was pretty exhausted, and uh, sounds like we hear all the time. It's true <laughs> that they decided we better rest. We only had 28 guys, but the bazooka man has to go with his patrol, so we'll have three bazookas because there are tanks out there, and you are to go with this company and full force of company patrol. It's a lot of guys. It was a flat, plowed field, and we walked for maybe a mile and came to this building, this radio station of some kind, had an antenna up there, and checked it out, went on from there, and I'm away in the back because I'm the bazooka man, you know. <coughs> you don't go out in front. <laughs> and they, uh, we get up to the villages, and the Germans are in their hope foxholes and on their perimeter, Sleep, and you go up and they check them out. And decide they aren't going to wake them up. They just want to see if they're there. <laughs> we are taking it today. We're taking it tomorrow. <clears throat> so uh, back we go, two or three miles, whatever it was, and we go by this station again, this building, and straight on into the village. And I flunk down. It's dawn, or almost dawn. <clears throat> Well, it was done, and I flop in this feather bed mattress thing, and I'm going to get some sleep. And then comes the sergeant, everybody up onto the tanks. The company's pinned down out there, or the rest of the battalion is pinned down. Officers are wounded, and sergeants were wounded, and they're in big trouble. So we go out, <laughs> pile up this. <laughs> These Shermans had, uh, take off, and two of them go through this mud water, and I know it's soft mud, and they get stuck. So six guys go on. We're all riding these tanks piggyback, and we take our guys off those two and get them on ours. <clears throat> now we're really crowded on top of these things, and we're roaring across this flat, plowed field. And uh, I don't see the radio station building. And I'll show you a picture of Mike Marinkovich, who's the wildest, bravest sergeant you ever want to meet. And uh, I said, hey, Mike, we're going the wrong way. He said, ah, shut up, my God, there's a company commander in that tank, and there's a tank commander in that tank. They know where they're going. I said, okay. <laughs> You know, forget it. I still don't see the building anywhere, and that's in straight line where these guys are pinned down. We're going the other way. And we come across a couple of outposts and blow them away, and I'm charging up to the uh, gully that ran across from a farmhouse, and the village goes off over here. Tanks all pull up, have to stop because they can't go down this big, deep gorge this stream bed, but it's real deep. And we hardly stop, and the turret flies off the tank next to mine. And I fly off the tank to the village, and so does everybody else. That Sherman, or Tiger, is in the barn over there, and he picks off all six tanks, blows the turrets right off each one. By the time I get to the village, I'm running, I'm first guy there, <laughs> I'm running like a rabbit. <laughs> 
and carried my bazooka in three shells. My assistant has three shells and his rifle. And uh, I get to the village, and it's a separate house from the line of the village street. And I look back, and all the tanks are on fire. All of them were killed except the company commander, who was totally white, stunned or concussion or whatever he had. And he wanders for two or three miles back until they find him. And uh, he just, uh, the war was over for <laughs> him. So we all run to the village and we all make it. And even though they're shooting at us, one guy gets there, he lost his helmet, he picks up the helmet, he's got a crease going across about five inches long. And <clears throat> we clear this first house and uh, go across the street and uh, clear all the other houses, check them out. Uh, and then we, uh, the sergeant, we don't have an officer, so just 28 guys. And the sergeant's a tech sergeant, but he, and he's been with the outfit for many months. He, this, this division started in Iceland with a bunch of draftees, trained in North Ireland and came down, didn't go on the bulge because, or the D-Day because they're holding them for Patton's Cobra sweep around the south of France and relief at St. Lo. So uh, this guy was a regimental type of guy, not a, not a combat guy, even though he'd been with the outfit since the front. And he says, uh, yeah. I uh, went over to a village on this side, facing the barn where the tank was. A little tiny house, and a little back window, must have been a bathroom window or something. And I see the tank coming along the road with a hundred guys out in front of it. Approximately, I don't know, <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, I put my bazooka out the window and I fired. And the shell goes right at that tank, and there's a six-inch tree, you know, a row of trees, and I hit that tree. Well, the plaster in the house was just flying all over, and smoke was pouring out the window, and obviously they knew where I was. You know? <laughs> and I was smart enough that I, I should say I was seasoned enough to know they knew where I was, so I got out of there. In fact, I had a fire when my bazooka hit the wall. That's how close I was crunched into this little window. I get out in the street and there's a big wagon till, tipped over in a dung heap, which is, used to be in front of every house in Germany and France. Not anymore, they're all cleaned up. Just amazing. <laughs> so we, uh, the sergeant comes out, McCarthy, get behind that trailer out or that wagon out in the middle of the street and set up for that tank. So you go to hell, Sergeant. You think I'm going to sit out there in the middle of the street against the 88 cannon? Oh, you better do it. I said, I'm going over here. I go over to this little house, and it's uh, on the curve going out of town. This garage is about 12 feet long. And I get in this window. Anything that has to come out has to show itself so I can shoot this way, see? Because then they have to turn and go out of town. Here's the house over here that we took first, the big two-story house. And uh, if this guy had been anything worthwhile, he would have had this defense organized, but by then I'm not telling anybody, <laughs> except for my own benefit, so I, uh, set up with my assistant in the window. And uh, the, we hear that, we know the tank's coming because I saw it, you know. And you could hear it now, it's coming down the street. And some of the Germans try to go around us, out through the back, because the villagers are just a house wide, you know, just uh, deep. And some of the guys were set up at the back and they, they got these guys, picked them off, and uh, stopped them from going that way. And I, uh, 
nobody does anything except stands at the back door hoping I get the tank. <laughs> because if I did, they had two miles of plat plowed field to run on. <laughs> hold, hold that thought for just a second, because I know you're going to get. So you're uh, you're hiding out in this structure. Yeah, just waiting in a window, front window, good sized window, and I have my bazooka aimed at the corner. And you know, tiger's an awesome thing. It's a big thing. It's a 15 foot barrel on this thing, or whatever, however long, a big 88 or 90 millimeter cannon. And a flash hider in front of that. <coughs> and, uh, I, uh, you know, we're a little nervous out here. <laughs> that was uh, to do any standing there, whatever you want to do. He's, he's an old guy, he's 32 years old. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, we haven't quite set up the uh, defense yet. And uh, I put down my bazooka and I heard a noise and I went down the basement. The basement was full of civilians, jam-packed in there. The whole village must have been in this thing. And I looked at these two guys. They were too young to be old villagers who weren't fighting. They ripped their shirt open. They're Italian soldiers. The Germans had pulled Italians up into that area to help out, do a grunt work, and. Uh, these two guys were <laughs> there, so we took them up in prisoners, and uh, the uh, I went back upstairs again. The tanks getting closer and closer, and uh, the uh, I'm just about thinking it's going to come around, and I'm ready to fire anything that comes around. And a ten-year-old girl comes around the corner. I go, jeez. Oh, <laughs> he runs into the house and we put her down with all the people. She apparently didn't get out of her house. And I almost blew her away. Yeah. Oh, jeez. The best. So, that part over, we uh, then wait again. Now it's starting to get dark, dusk. And uh, we're getting no support. No radios, no nothing. We don't have any way to call in <laughs> anything. So uh, the tank comes up without showing its muzzle and fires three rounds back at this house. And part of our squad or platoons back in this house. <coughs> and he uh, uh, Fired at the house and hit the walls. And these walls, you know, big houses back there, are pretty thick, stone and what have you. And uh, Marinkovich is back there in that house with some of the squad, and it blows them all over the room and just bounces them all over, but nobody gets hurt. It's an amazing bunch of guys, 28 with the counting the medic who had no armor. Thing. So, uh, <coughs> They get out of there. <laughs> they come over to our side of the road. <laughs> but uh, the tank uh, then decides he's going to move forward. But they send out a couple of guys first. And the first guy comes around, it's an Iron Cross guy <laughs> with a submachine gun. I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me, and we're 12 feet away. So I had no choice. The next day, the platoon picks up the Iron Cross. Some of the guys found it and gave it to me. Uh, then uh, I said, hey, Tatuni, I can't use this thing for a sniper rifle. <laughs> You've got to stand here, and he's a good shot. So I said, you pick off anything that moves around there except the tank. Well, one more guy tried it, and he got him, and he falls behind the dung heap. But it obviously got him good. So uh, then the tank really gets mad and he fires a couple more rounds, <laughs> decides to come forward. But he doesn't know I'm in this corner. He just knows that these shots came from someplace down around the bend there. 
and uh, he didn't have a skirt on. The tanks had a <coughs> skirt for artillery and bazooka thing to protect their wheels. <coughs> now a Sherman or a Tiger has eight inches of armor plate. The bazooka is only supposed to penetrate six or seven, depending on circumstance. And uh, I count three bogey wheels. They're great big wheels on this thing. One, two, three. He's committed. Now. He's out here, and the thing's sticking out, but he can't turn his turret yet. So I fire. <coughs> it blows me into Dooney back into the room. <laughs> Hit over hills. I mean, the <coughs> force was fantastic, and it killed the tank. And uh, somebody in, you know, a, a hollow nose <coughs> shell penetrates the metal, just a small hole. But if you have seven or eight inches of steel in front of the hole, it blows it inside. And uh, somebody started up the engine and backed it up a foot. We were trying to put a new <laughs> rocket in the thing. <coughs> you got to slide it in, pull the pin, slide it in the locket, take a little wire and put it around the coil because it's a magneto. And you're going like this. <laughs> so uh, we didn't get the second shot off. He moved back behind the building and died again. But that's all we needed. Uh, we sweat all night, I'm wondering what's going to happen. At dawn the next morning, we huge artillery barrage comes in with really hard artillery barrage. Preparation for the regimental objective. <laughs> That's what this village is. We'd taken the regimental objective by mistake, see? <laughs> well, a regimental objective means a battalion's going to attack the other battalions or the other part at least a battalion force. Marinkovich is in the room behind me with a couple of other guys. And Don's coming after the artillery barrage. An American grade grenade lands in the middle of the room. <laughs> you know, he's an old veteran too, and so these guys dive out the window. And the whole road is lined with American troops for a miles. So they didn't know you guys were there? No, they didn't know where they were there, you know. Well, we've been here fighting all night. <laughs> said, this is our objective. What are you doing? <laughs> said, I'll go ask the guys over there at the tanks. <laughs> huh. Well, that must have been, and maybe it wasn't, with the, with the bazooka. Like you said, it wasn't a sniper gun. Yeah. Was that pretty traumatic to have? Um, now, you'd faced a lot of already pretty close combat prior to being in this village, right? I mean, yeah, but I didn't use it for a rifle. Because <laughs> you're usually hitting pretty good sized yeah. targets. That... The way I got the bazooka was the guy who had it was a real fine, brave soldier. Swam rivers in front of us and checked out patrols. He did everything. He came to me. He'd been in Iceland, North Ireland been over five years and he's going home. He says, they all call me Chick, because that's so he's a little young looking at And uh, he said, uh, Chick, I'm going home in a couple of weeks and uh, I'd like to have stripes. I own that PFC and you're a PFC. And my outfit, they don't promote many guys. <clears throat> Just uh, he had to die in front of him or something. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, there are no corporals, just sergeant, buck sergeants, and staff sergeants, and PFCs in a squad, and privates. And he said, uh, you're next in line, being the BAR man, would you trade the BAR for the bazooka so I can be sergeant next time? He said, hello, Howard, you're a much braver better soldier than I'll ever be. <laughs> I said, sure, I'll take it. <coughs> <coughs> so uh, we trade. <coughs> A week later, uh, he's killed in front of me. 
I'm in his place and he's in mine. Do you have anything to drink? Yeah, let me get you a cup of water. Uh, Psalm 119. Floating back to maneuver around in this small attack we're in, the burst of a machine gun in the woods gets Howard and dies on the way of going back. And I said, from, from now on, I won't volunteer for anything. <laughs> I don't care what it is. I want to get through this thing, and uh, there's no volunteering. And I uh, told myself that, I guess I told some others because I never did volunteer again. And I stayed a PFC. That's how I ended up at Warburg PFC. Huh. Well, when I came back to the village, uh, when the, after all this night was over, and everybody was wondering how, what happened in this Picklestein. We had to hike about a half a mile or two down to where the company was. And, we can straggling in. Captain, lieutenant style captain, he's shaking his head, looking at us. <laughs> and uh, the platoon got together <laughs> and wrote me up for a medal. But I never got it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, it never happened. They sent it in for a DSC, and uh, it was returned, recommended. Silver Star, never heard again. Huh. We went from there to attack to, uh, on down different area and direction, and the war was moving very fast, and all I cared about was getting to the end. <laughs> Couldn't care less. From the right up in the rear pocket, uh, captain calls me in and says, Carthy, get cleaned up, Carlson clean clothes. <laughs> you look like hell. <laughs> and uh, you're going to the battalion. For, what's that for? She's for an interview for OCS in Paris. Oh, <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to do that. But <clears throat> I said, well, okay. <clears throat> I'm the only guy with college of any kind. See, these guys are all hillbillies. One of the guys, in fact, is a uh, uh, Hackett. The Hackett's and the McCoys and all oh, those really? guys. Oh, wow. <laughs> they, uh, he was one of them. <laughs> and these guys were totally uneducated mountain boys. A lot of them were coal miners from Pennsylvania and stuff. And, and here I was, four months of college. <laughs> so uh, I go back there in this beautiful castle and uh, five colonels sitting up there. And I come in reporting, you know, and all that. We've been reading your uh, file here, McCarthy. It says, you were in the Battle of Metz? <laughs> this is <laughs> way back. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, did you attack the forts? Said, yes, sir. He says, what sort of uh, attack? I said, well, most of our were flanking attacks. And we uh, occasionally... Uh, tried to get into their tunnels, but uh, as you know, it was a difficult battle. Seven big forts in Metz that had to be cleared, and Germans, if you've ever seen the Maginot Lines uh, set up, they had floors of railroads and bunk beds and all kinds of stuff. <coughs> a lot of the Germans holed up in there. So, <coughs> uh, the second regiment spent seven days clearing it while we <laughs> cleaned our, licked our wounds <laughs> and cleaned up a little bit because we were the first platoon into uh, Metz. Wasn't a lot of resistance because <laughs> they're all down the forts. So <coughs> they uh, war uh, ended in Czechoslovakia. We as I mentioned, dropped off all our clothes and warm stuff. Came to the base of this mountain, <laughs> it's a six or eight thousand foot peak. And uh, outposts we had up there 
was wiped out by the uh, Germans the night before. And we were told to go up and find them. So we, it's a cold, foggy day, and there's a bunch of officers standing there. I don't know if one's patting or who they were, but <laughs> watching us go by, <coughs> went out and hiked up, trudged up this mountain, up the roads and all around, and finally got up to almost to the top. <coughs> In fact, we were on the top because there's a monument there <coughs> marking the three borders of Austria, Germany, in Czechoslovakia, where the three borders go, and there's a monument. So like a bunch of kids, you know, we go and walk around the monument. <laughs> down the hill, we get halfway down <coughs> the hill, and here's this beautiful mountain, uh, lodge, hunting lodge, in a lake, scenic place. And we're back in the snow again, and cold. <laughs> no, no long johns. <coughs> and, uh, I, I ride my bazooka down the snow, <laughs> sit on it, ride it down like a sled. And we get down close to this thing and it's just starting to get light. And we attack the resort <coughs> building, catch all the Germans in their underwear, <laughs> running out of the doors and the windows. And we, we capture them all and we captured a payroll of $14,000. <laughs> Which I understand <coughs> the officers get to split up. <laughs> Shortly after that, uh, we go out to the uh, front of this building. The company moves into the lodge. And we go out in this beautiful mountain village, uh, houses, you know, kind of like uh, Alps or something, looking down this great valley in Czechoslovakia. And, and uh, <coughs> this may, Third, 45, and the wars to end in four days, <laughs> and we were shooting that night, we got guys out on, on the porch and stuff in the little house, and I had my bazooka and I had a 45, and we went out into the uh, night and some guys started shooting at us, and we sprayed the woods and walked around, cleaned out all the area, and went back. And I had the pre-dawn duty on the guard. And I came in, sat down with this Pennsylvania Dutch boy, he could speak German. I laid my 45 on the table and had a cup of coffee. And we had a guy out on the deck who was kind of shell-shocked. Well, he's had this weird look at his eyes, you know. And he's now the B.A.R. man, too. But he'd trudge along. I don't know if he knew how to fire the thing. So uh, he yells, help, help, come quick. And I, we run out the door, and this German guy had a submachine gun in my stomach with a pistol in the other hand, and I said, come on, it's four days before the end of the war. <laughs> And uh, I yelled back to Stetzel and said, get out of here and start speaking German as fast as you can. <laughs> and he comes running out, he starts yakking, and the guy drops his guard and we beat the hell out of him. <laughs> Take away his guns and uh, he had in his belt, uh, he had a P-38, which is a, like a Luger, but it's a good collector's gun. And I lost all my pistols and stuff during different thing. And uh, in his belt, though, he had a Russian revolver, and I didn't bring it with me because it's mounted on a, in a case and I couldn't take it apart. With, uh, about an eight-inch silencer on it. It's an old pistol revolver made in Russia. He was a Air Force uh, Luftwaffe officer escaping from the Russians. He was coming off a of close now. Prague's only 50 miles away, <coughs> we're pushing for space. <coughs> we uh, disarm the guy, take it away, and I said, you speak German, you can have the pistol, you take him back to company headquarters. This guy's arguing, fought, and arguing all the way back. 
Meanwhile, I took the, um, the silencer and it had uh, flush bullet heads in the uh, cartridge and uh, so I fired off all the rounds. In fact, Frank remembers us doing that. And I brought it back <coughs> while I was in college. I went to Cal Berkeley in journalism. And uh, when I came home for Christmas, my father had read in the paper where you're supposed to register all your souvenirs. He took all my stuff down there. They confiscated my revolver that I carried it my back all the way home. <laughs> and uh, I came into the police station. I knew the police chief, small town, you know, Riverside. Hey, uh, you confiscated one of my war souvenirs and I want it back. I carry this thing on my back all the way home. Oh yeah, that one with the silencer. The FBI is interested in that. They don't have one like that in their collection. I said, that's too bad. Go get their own. <laughs> I said, I want it back. He said, you can't have it. It's got a silencer against the law. I said, well, I'll argue about that. <clears throat> he said, well, go down and see the DA. The police department backs up to the courthouse and the DA. And everything. I stomp into the DA's office and said, I want my pistol back with the silencer. Said, well, here's the law. You can't have one. The muscles report it. Of a firearm. So yeah, they unscrew the end and I dump out all the baffle plates and I screw them back in and I said, bye. <laughs> and I walk out. <laughs> so you got your pistol. I got my pistol back and he didn't say a word. <laughs> he just laughed. <laughs> Is that, the most of the souvenirs you collected, were they just uh, souvenirs that were confiscated over the ways or, or was it, were there? No, all during the war. Each one has a story like that. I didn't, I, I had a 7.65 Belgian pistol I gave to a medic because they're unarmed and we're doing night attacks, which are scary as hell. And <clears throat> he was unarmed. So he gets wounded and goes back with my pistol. <laughs> so I lost that one and I had an extra 45. How about the, the bars you have with uh, the... Uh... I forget how many years of service. It's got the, uh, I think it had the, the eagle and, and then had a crossed rifle on it that you'd sent to a girlfriend or something like that. Oh, the, the, uh, those campaign ribbons? Yeah. Those were very old, uh, early ones of Polish campaign, which is the first campaign. And this old guy, was, he, he's probably 40 years old, <laughs> but he looked uh, 80. I tell you, he'd been through all the years of the war. And I captured him in this woods we were fighting in, and I had him dig the hole while I kept guard on the place because the Germans are all around us. And, and he had this thing on his coat, and I asked him if I could have it. He said, sure. And I said, what's that one? What's this mean? He told me what they all meant. The other one, as I mentioned out there, I sent it home to a girlfriend and told her all about it, and I have her letter. <laughs> Uh, when she sent it back to me, and I guess she sent it back because she died two years ago, uh -huh. or a year ago, yeah. and I had seen her at a high school reunion, and she looked terrible, so I, uh, she uh, said she had this, and she'd like to send it to me, so she sent it with a copy of the letter that I sent to her. Huh. She was 15 years of service in the German Army, <laughs> wow. the middle ribbon. <clears throat> Every one of these things that I have, I uh, took off prisoners I personally captured. Uh, in fighting for worms, we fought down the street, and the Ryan's right there, and the Germans were just going right <laughs> over the Ryan and out, you know. And it had been bombed for many years. All rebuilt. It's beautiful now. And we came to the cathedral, and uh, fighting pretty much stopped. And uh, I went over nearby, and at the side of the cathedral was a village of cardboard and scrap woods and stuff. People had built these shacks, and they're living there all during this fighting. And uh, so we stopped, mm -hmm. and I put down my bazooka, and I don't smoke or anything, so I'm just standing around watching, looking. The uh, two German 
people come up to me and they look at me and I can't parlay and I can't parlay English, so I say, come. Oh, yeah? I put my hand on my 45 and I walk along with this other guy and, and he takes us in and we get surrounded by all these civilians. Jeez, where are all these people come from? And what do they want? And they all look at me and nod and think I'm a nice, clean-looking American boy. <laughs> so they lead me down the street and around and with the other guy, too. And I can't even remember who that was. We come around the corner and they go into a little house that's on the Ryan Bank. And here's a couple of guys in there smashed on schnapps. And this one guy says, oh, Harry, you let me pour you a drink. <laughs> He's going to give me a drink of schnapps. The war's over, Fred. So I take the two prisoners and that was the rifle I got and the, the bayonet. See, the bayonet's a very old bayonet. And these two guys have been in a long time. One's an aircraft, one was a tanker. Uh, I sent the, the one rifle home and some guy stole it and we rushed on. It's hard to hide a rifle, even, <laughs> even though I tried. <laughs> but just the length of it and the shape of it. So those two are from those guys and every just about everything I have has some personal contact with it. Otherwise I didn't take it. Uh -huh. I do I didn't bring it with me but I got a SS black jacket on too. <laughs> I forgot about it. It's out in my wood shop. <laughs> wow. It's a leaded or something. I don't know if it really you hit anybody with it. <laughs> it's, a, it's that long. <laughs> What was the what was the worst part of the service for you? Well, I guess the fighting would be the the way we live like animals. I mean, we were so dirty and hangnails and totally exhausted, lack of sleep, divisions like. Uh, 101st, they were in rest camp for three months after D-Day. While, you know, they're, they're fighting, sure, and they did all this stuff. They called them up to Bastogne. They came into Bastogne to help fortify it. That was their first fighting in three months. We never had three months off. And the same happened to 82nd or any of the other outfits. Uh, some would have time off. If you were wounded, like Frank, he went to London and you know lost four months in the Battle of the Bulge. He lost that, and I just felt lucky as hell because I never got hit. And yet I was came so close so many times. I had an officer desert me under fire, heavily shelled by our people and the Germans on this hilltop. And uh, <coughs> we saw him get up and run to the rear. Now he says he's going back to stop the artillery. That's not his job, see. <coughs> and we're just getting really pounded by this stuff. I mean, every inch. And I'm laying with my bazooka against a big boulder. And the shell hit that boulder and lifted me two or three feet in the air and dropped me like a wet blanket, you know. Another guy next to me, who I never met before, had scraped his way under the rock, and he got under, but there was no dirt around where I was, so I just stayed there all night with him. When, uh, before it got dark, we could look down the hill, and there were some bunkers down there, log bunkers. And uh, this was in the spring, I guess, the snow had gone. and. Uh, it was clean shot down there. But when we tried to go down there during the night to get to these bunkers, all the trees had been mowed down. We were climbing through these branches and branches and branches trying to get to this thing. We get down to this dugout. And I said, geez, what happened up there anyway? We really got bounced around. 
and uh, we made a lot of noise coming down the hill. And uh, we were trying to find the entrance to these things in the dark, and the mortar shell comes in. And he says, oh, I'm hit. Oh, God. Says, well, it turned out that shrapnel slapped him. Didn't cut him. It stung him real good, you know. And he's sitting there holding his leg. And I said, are you bleeding? I said, I don't know. I can't see it. You know? So I said, get some help. So I start to go toward these huts. I know they're dug into the side of the hill. And I trip, I fall, and I go down between the bank and the hut. And I'm standing on my head with my helmet shook. I'm standing up, and I hit the side of the thing. And I listen, Germans talking inside. It's all great. <laughs> what happened to the platoon? <laughs> so I go around to the front door and open it up. They thought it was the enemy. I thought they were the enemy. It's just they had four German prisoners in the back, and I pounded the wall against them. So we we were listed as totally lost. The whole outfit was wiped out. Not one guy got hurt. Well, yeah, we had one wounded, and then we had some the German soldiers, one of them, or arm wound or something. We came walking out of those woods to the company, and he, <laughs> Lieutenant Sander, shaking his head again. That's <laughs> uh, probably the oh second or third time that we became the lost platoon. <laughs> You've heard of the lost battalion, well, you're the lost platoon, totally gone. Thought we were wiped out. We show up, nobody hurt. Killed many times over during World yeah, War II, huh? Yeah, sure did. Huh. Yeah, it happened a lot of times. I, uh, the day Frank got wounded, uh, I took his BAR and he ran to the rear, a bullet or a shrapnel through his arm. And uh, the next morning we attacked this village. And a little while, and uh, we come up through a tank trap. This Siegfried line is not too far up the hill. This village is in, a, I thought was our objective. And we go into the, uh, I'm coming up the hill and this guy is in the first house is shooting at us. So I swing my BAR over and I fire two rounds and the next one goes in and bends over in the, in the chamber. Folds right up. So now it's hot. And you can't get this thing out. You get a you have a tool in the end of the BAR that's extractor and does different things, you know. And I can't get this damn thing out, so I'm still stripping it in my coat pocket. And this is uh, like December. Uh, I think Frank said he got wounded December seventh or something like that. <coughs> the uh, bulge was the sixteenth. <coughs> this start of it. Uh, so I, the platoon company go, goes ahead up to the left, and well, I don't know where they're going. They never tell you. This is probably the worst thing they could do. They don't do it so much anymore. They never told the guy below, a sergeant, where you're going or what you're doing or what the objective is. That's dumb. Because if they got wiped out, you didn't know where to go. Well, this is a good example. I uh, pick up a straggling squad of heavy machine gun people with a lieutenant. Say, hey, lieutenant, where are we going? I don't know. I mean, they didn't tell you either. <laughs> no. I said, well, He's a new guy and he doesn't know the way around anyway. And he said, I'll, uh, let's go. I'm the old pro get <coughs> I, uh, I said, but for God's sakes, spread out. You guys are bunched up like a bunch of carrots. Just as I say that and we start moving out, mortar shell comes right square in the middle. Takes the lieutenant's side, lays it open, you know. No blood, just laid it open. Couldn't figure out what, what the hell happened. And four or five of the other, or eight of us now, 
five get wounded. There are three of us left to take care of these guys. And we don't know where to go. I said, well, usually if there's a village nearby, we take the village. <laughs> I'll go down and check the village and get a medic. So I <laughs> go down this hill. I laid my stuff down, uh, BAR, which is malfunction. Frank later tells me he had trouble with it too. <laughs> I said, thanks, Frank. <laughs> was, uh, uh, I grabbed the guy's carbine, uh, Lieutenant's carbine, light he carry, and I run down to the village. I come down to the village. It's too damn quiet down here for the Americans to just take it. The Yanks just raise hell when they get to the village. And there's a fountain there, and I walk around the fountain again. Uh, I'm getting the hell out of here. This is too spooky. <laughs> I start running up the hill and they start shelling me all the way up the hill. <laughs> I get back to the group and by then we've got the things we put together and patch them up and got a medic from the company which was up in the pillbox of the Siegfried line. I go up there and the lieutenant says, where in the hell you been, McCurdy? Oh, I was down in the village looking around. <laughs> you were what? <laughs> Say that's tomorrow's objective. <laughs> Say, well, I thought I'd check it out. There's nobody there. You might as well go take the village. <laughs> <coughs> oh, he spent quite a few days there and got 75 replacements. We're down to very few guys. 75 replaced a whole bunch of Californians. <laughs> National Guard guys. We thought they were something else. You know. No combat experience, nothing. And uh, the lieutenant knows I'm an old BAR man. I just got it the day before. <laughs> and he says, come up and demonstrate marching fire, which I'll explain to you later. Uh, okay, the lieutenant's new too. So I load the BAR and I come up over a hill and I'd put a uh, bulb, a big light thing up against the bank 50 yards away. And I go, and I wipe out the say, hey, that's not the way you shoot. You're supposed to go bam, 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 bam. I said, Lieutenant, I've been here for a while. I'll do it my way. You do your way. Because <laughs> there was a lot of that, wasn't there? There was the theory yeah, the that they tell you, and then there's the reality of... Yeah. So the uh, next day, a truck comes in. A more, uh, uh, Ordnance truck. And I go to the ordnance truck. I said, gee, I've never seen one of you guys before. I've got a problem with this uh, BAR. He said, it won't eject the cartridge. Oh, you probably need a new spring. But I only have two of them. I said, I only need one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> so he gives me <laughs> dumb guys. And, uh, after that, BAR worked fine until I traded it for the Zuka. <laughs> it sounds like in your time you lost a lot of people over your time. That you turned mean? over five times. Company turned over five times. There were only three guys that survived without a wound. That was one. They were uh, in Martin. Martin missed a lot of fight. And uh, one other guy. Marinkovich was wounded three times, never left the line. He'd get a fragment in him or something, go back and take it out and get a purple heart. <laughs> I got to go to the head. Okay, right down the hallway there. Marching fire. Marching fire. Marching fire was developed by the 5th Division. And uh, the way it got started was in the grape orchards in you know, in, uh, near St. Lowe. Uh, they got trapped out in a vineyard one day and they had to get out of there. And of course they have all these little fences, you know, <laughs> and screw up. That meant you had to stand up all the way through. So they stood up and started firing and firing and firing and marching, marching until they get, went clear through the place and nobody got hurt. After that, when we got into a battle, 
if we knew the Germans were facing us in any strength, we would march toward them like the old British. <laughs> but with the, most of them had BARs or Garands or you know, M1s or a bazooka. And um, as soon as the Germans fired a shot, you would hear a massive click of safety and shooting would start. In any typical fight, a rifleman would go through maybe three bandoliers of ammo. Each one has, I don't know what it was, eight or ten clips. He might, so we carried like 300 rounds or so. <laughs> and uh, you go, when I was rifleman for a short time, you're ready for attack, you go through and they hand you the number of bandoliers they thought you would need. And we'd just fire and fire and fire. None of this push and aim and shoot and stuff. Keep so, shooting. I, I, so you're just basically putting out a screen of fire. On Christmas Day in the bulge, at the end of the bulge, we were attacking a hill over Hector Knock. Uh, I'd gone out the day before with a new lieutenant and a sergeant and a couple of other guys. I had the BAR. They were going down this pass. They were going to check out this plateau on top, a plowed field of fair up on top. It's all snow and everything. <coughs> and going along this path, <coughs> I said, hey, damn it, sorry, get up the hill. Don't go up that path. They said, no, nah, no, nah, that is the way. No. Well, I uh, got off the path and started up myself. It's me. I, I'm looking out for me, you know. And the German machine gunners sitting down the path open fire on these guys. They get the lieutenant almost in <laughs> his family jewels. And uh, the sergeant gets wounded and one other guy, and they drag him back off there. And I'm standing there with my BAR, which later kicked out <laughs> again. <laughs> but this time I could clear it faster. <clears throat> and I covered their retreat. But the tree I stopped behind was a big fir or whatever they are over there. And the bullets were flying off the bark of that tree and I just stood there <laughs> waiting. <"Ch -ch -ch -ch." laughs> and then I got down and helped them cover the retreat. We get back and we say the, the hill is <laughs> occupied. <laughs> Next morning we go up in battalion force with a Sherman tank trying to get up there somehow. But, uh, mind you, this is, this is in the Alps, the country <laughs> of... Uh, and uh, we uh, get the signal to move, and this force goes forward. One big line with reserves back here. And, and you could hear that click, machine gun fire, and you could hear the clicks and the firing, and they just walked right through these guys. When you talked to the prisoners after, they said, you guys laid down that screen, we couldn't put up our head to fire. And uh, we just mowed them down. So I think uh, we lost one or two guys in that, probably in the first thing, because even around me, they were <laughs> bullets skipping through the snow, you know? They hit somebody back there. <laughs> But we never stop for our wounded. Our Marines apparently have a thing where they always go get their wounded and stuff. That's bad news. Uh, in fact, uh, the Army's the same way. Look at uh, Senator Dole. He's on the line one week. A guy gets wounded with a 20 millimeter out in front of him or something. That's a big show. And he runs out to try to help him. Hell, the guy's been out there and got shot in that spot. Why would you go out to a spot where a guy just got hit? <laughs> and you even, uh, you even really get leery about jumping into shell holes because there's been a shell there before. <laughs> you don't want to occupy it. And you get these, uh, this uh, sense of how to fight and where to duck and how to duck. And and that's why a veteran on the line 
compared to a new replacement survives a lot longer. Uh, Hackett, uh, the mountain boy, uh, we used to kid him about being in the family group. It's not, not Hackett, it's... Uh, Hatfield. Hatfield. Hatfields and McCoys, right? Hatfield. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Hackett was a sergeant. Hatfield was one of the old time sergeants with the outfit. So he gave him a battlefield commission. A week later, he's wearing his nice polished brass bars. And we get in this woods fighting these Germans. And he looks over a log instead of around the log. The guy with any sense looks around the log. And he gets it right through between the eyes. We got the guy who did it, but uh, it's too bad. Hatfield was dead on arrival. How hard is that part of war? Losing well, we, s we rarely see the guys that are wounded or talk to them. Uh, it's, uh, if you're, you never make friends very much. Now, these guys were together in Ireland or in Iceland. So there are a lot of friendships and enemies in this group. And I was very, I guess I got to be very standoffish because I wouldn't make any friends. Uh, Frank and I were in the same hole, but he was gone most of the time. And uh, some of the guys who went over with, I had a nodding acquaintance, but we weren't really friends. And, and I kept it that way because it hurts when you lose one. So uh, the People who uh, were killed in these attacks were wounded. You never saw them. You kept going through your objective. We never were repulsed in any battle. The other regiment was knocked off a hill, but <laughs> we took it and held it. The uh, so you have to ask later. Uh, you know where so and so or what happened to so and so. And, uh, they tell you then, but you don't stop to help them with their wounds. Your job is to get the enemy out in front. And if you stop, you're going to join them. <laughs> Be right there. So, so this is... Uh, Very impersonal is what I'm saying. I was going to say, it sounds like there's a part of the mind that you can, mm -hmm. in those situations, bring it forward to, mm -hmm. to separate yourself from Yes, it. we've become very impersonal about the whole thing. And, uh, even uh, if the guys not in your outfit, like the Battle of the Bulge, you found them frozen all over the place, yeah, Germans and Americans. You know, you felt sorry for them, but you didn't know them. And uh, so they're just uh, too bad and they lost. <laughs> and you see so much of it that it... Yeah, you see so much of it. That you that get it. somewhat callous to it? Or? Yes, right, you get very callous. But Can you keep... Can you sustain that callous over 50 years or in looking back? I, I talked to one gentleman that said the fear wasn't while you were fighting. The fear was when you went on break and then thought, oh, my God, I have to go back to, to fighting. It, the, uh, I never wanted to go on pass uh, because it's too hard to come back that one time I did. Yeah, but I was fairly new to the outfit. And I... Uh, if you're wounded, it was very hard to come back because uh, you know you get wounded again. You thought and you feared. Plus, I was single. I was 19. I had no close girlfriend. I had girlfriends, but people wrote to me and we danced and all that sort of thing. And uh, uh, I never wanted a full commitment of any kind because uh, I was only 19 and I had ideas ahead that I wanted to fulfill. So uh, everybody uh, who came back, uh, one of the toughest things was somebody with a family uh, who got killed or wounded and you knew his company commander has to write to him. That's a tough job. And in Frankfurt, uh, this happened. 
right in front of me, so I, I it kind of touched me. The radio man had been with us for quite a while. He's a good friend of the commander because he's with him all the time, the CO. And we came out of the train station and a German stepped around a construction shack with a burp gun and a little sub and uh, killed him right behind the captain. <laughs> He's over here with the radio and the captain's over here. I had to come up because there was a tank out there and they called me up and I had to sit over his body and wait for the tank which I chased all around town for two or three days and never found him. But <clears throat> that sort of thing, you knew, would really hit home because he had family and a wife and everything at home. So it was, that, that's probably uh, not the hardest part of the war because you are impersonal. I think living it and uh, you do have a fear, but after a while you get pretty callous to that too. You just know when to get up and when to duck and when to roll and stuff. And so uh, it's not quite as bad and you can beat out shells day after day. You know, hear them coming and beat them to the ground or beat them in the ditch or whatever. So uh, the more you do it, the better you get. <laughs> but I feel sorry for uh, recruit when they come in. It's, uh, he must have really shaken their head when they saw me. <laughs> and Martin and these other guys that came in because they're all 19, 20 years old. Pretty ragged looking at that time, I would assume, after you've been out on the battle and these young guys come in clean uh, shaven. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we smell. <laughs> you ever saw Balded Scar do one of them where we, they bring in this new replacement into this dugout and all these guys are in there. And uh, Joe says to Willie, I don't smell anything. Do you, Willie? <laughs> do, do you remember what you guys talked about? I mean, I know a lot of time you were working. Hometown. And they all showed you girlfriend pictures and stuff. I didn't carry any of those. And I, uh, I get a few letters from my Christmas package from my folks arrived in February. It's all broken up. <laughs> And uh, mother sent me shaving cream and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I didn't care if I shaved or not, but uh, in those days, the army, you shaved. So you didn't have a beard like yourself. They had, uh, you're spitting polish all the time. You'd see these old guys up there in the snowbank, <laughs> cleaning their thing in the snow. Shaving with cold ice water. You're out in the middle of the bulls fighting, and yeah. they still expect you to follow yeah. protocol. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. So did 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 in your conversation and talking about home, can you remember a, a common conversation you guys had that that I don't know if it helped you get away from the war or what? What? Yeah, you usually bragged about your hometown or your home state. I was so glad when we got a few Californians <laughs> as replacements because I was the only one of the whole <laughs> platoon and the, uh, some of them didn't turn out to be that great, but uh, they, uh, they helped. We were coming home on a victory ship under the uh, Washington Bridge and we were going up the Hudson to West Point to get off. And the fireboats were all out and everything. It was shortly after the end of the war. We were going to the Pacific. So <laughs> they were shipping us out to reserve in Tokyo Bay. It was my assignment. I knew it already. So uh, I was happy when the bomb dropped. <coughs> the uh, guy next to me was Frank Randazzle from Brooklyn. I mean, he's real Brooklyn. There it is, the longest single span bridge in the world. <laughs> I said, ah, da, da. <laughs> the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is. Ah, right the way we go. <laughs> Sailing under the bridge. <laughs> huh. But that's the main arguments usually is that sort of thing. He really didn't talk a lot about stuff. Uh, 
Frank and I did because we were in the hole together all the time. And we'd uh, talk about our colleagues. He went to Texas A&M, and then when he got home, he went to Texas University and graduated from there as an engineer. <laughs> and uh, we would talk about those places, you know, a lot. But his wife died a couple of years ago of cancer, and, and that's what we talked to him about taking a trip. He said, I'd love to. <laughs> so uh -huh. he went, rented a British Opal. It's the only car you could take into Czechoslovakia without having to stolen. <laughs> but it turned out to be one great car. He drove it 3,011 miles, visited three cemeteries, found guys we knew. Uh, they treat you very nice at these places. Uh, you, uh, we hadn't planned to visit any, and we got to the one where Patton was and went out and looked it up. And we knew that the guys buried here were killed in the Battle of the Bullets, so I knew a few, and Frank knew a few. And so we, uh, <clears throat> you go to the office and give them your regiment and division, and they run a computer printout, and give you all the names the guys buried there, not necessarily killed because some were taken home, but those who families wanted them to stay and be buried there. Uh, one was a little uh, Mexican boy who, uh, zoot suiter, you know, 40s with zoot suit type. And Mexican love zoot suits, particularly in California. He is from San Antonio and uh, kind of swagger like a zoot suiter, you know, same age. And so we kind of had a friendship going with it, kidding each other. And uh, we got into an attack in the snow one night and uh, hit this forest of woods. And Germans had a 75 cannon on the other side of it, and uh, they sent shells into the trees, which they tree burst, they called it. It's like an air burst. All this stuff comes down on you. And uh, I was, they put me in the middle of this thing and I said I should be out on the flank and he said, no, nah, you stay up the middle. All right, what the hell? <laughs> and uh, I saw the whole squad in front of me get wiped out by the airburst and I turned and went to the left. Well, he got it in the stomach and he's the only wounded guy I talked to during the war. and. Uh, because of our lousy medical facilities and services, he died that night of exposure and his wounds. He said he didn't feel very good. He had a stomach full of shrapnel. Well, the uh, bazooka man on the flank fired into the 75, hit the ammo dump and blew the whole thing sky high. <laughs> and if we had uh, had proper medical, we came back by the med station five miles back, at least five miles, trudging back from this battle. And uh, we threw rocks and bricks and anything we put our hands on at the building. It was set back, big mansion, two-story building, nice and warm, smoke coming out of the place. And, and the doctors are in there and all their staff. We hated them because uh, guys had died that night. Besides uh, uh, Martinez, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure it's because of the lack of we had no helicopters. We had no, didn't have them in those days. You know? So the medical service was not good. They depended on the your medic with you, one medic to a platoon unarmed. And those guys had a terrible job. <laughs> so the medic would have to theoretically stabilize them and then you'd have to schlep them five miles back. Yeah. And, uh, wow. And you didn't know if it's clear or not. You know, we fought through this area, but uh, still uh, going back, you could be picked off too. Yeah. Was, was that hard going back 50 years later and seeing? Uh, 
Well, because you talked about separating yeah. yourself during the war, did this give you a chance? Just to... touchy, yeah. Uh, Frank uh, found a sergeant who was a friend and was buried in one of them. He uh, cried, it really uh, touched him because they'd become two good of friends. <laughs> That's when you realize you shouldn't really be personal. Yeah, but 50 years later, you know, when you... Yeah, if you go back and think, uh, here you are, you've uh, had a life, you've uh, married, had a family, and all this time, this guy's been in the hole. So it's uh, a little touchy that if you know who that guy is. It's, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that that was a... Uh, a hard part for them, and, and the other is is when they close their eyes and they see their friends, they still see a 19-year-old boy or 20-year-old mm -hmm. kid that, mm -hmm. like you said, never had the chance to, to yeah. do. And then the other extreme is, I've heard the others that just say, you know, the one thing I learned is, I just learned that when it's my time, it's my time. But they right. said they... You become a, a fatalist, very much so. You have a kind of a, a foxhole religion. I always said a little prayer before we jumped off. But it's very short. <laughs> Guide and protect me. <laughs> Way you go. Short and to the point and efficient. Yeah. And you hope that it works well. That was it. Wow. Well, in the bulge, we uh, waiting for the sun to come out and the Air Force to help. <laughs> we were still doing attacks and... Uh, uh, day before Christmas, before we met on this other little patrol, I had noted uh, uh, there was a Catholic mass going on in this one area, and uh, there were quite a few guys there. And uh, that night, when we moved into this area, we stupidly took over German holes because the ground was so hard. I found an old mattress and uh, put it in the bottom and the Dooney and I crawled into the hole and tried to get sleep and the heavy shelling came in, 15 guys were killed with the artillery and uh, most of them were those Catholics <laughs> They had gone to this mass. And, and the same thing was uh, with other events that turn you into a real fatalist, you know. But I think I've worn you out with all these <laughs> stories. 